my sheep know my voice and the voice of a stranger they will not follow. Whatever it is that I've done to date, it has been by the faithfulness, the mercy and the ability to hear God properly, obey Him and more importantly, trust His faithfulness. I'm Shani Hazan. Eight years ago, I had an opportunity to be the CEO of an investment banking company in Nigeria. It was the dream that anyone would ever imagine. That at the height of my role, I woke up one morning and I had a lot, you know, instructed me saying, you will have to drop this position and then I will want you to take your skills and begin to teach other people how to start and build their own companies. Less than 24 months after resigning my position as the CEO of that bank, the Lord provided me an opportunity to buy the company I am currently uh, leading here in the United States. I couldn't even amass the resources to buy this business. But when I was in the place where the Lord instructed me to be, when I was talking to the seller, I said to him, I said, look, this is what I've done, this is what I'm doing, and this is what I will do with this business. At this point, I will not be able to write you the check to pay off the business. Will you mind being the bank? And he said to me, what are you saying? This is my life work. You want me to be the bank? I said, well, if I will share with you the vision and the desire of my heart of what I'm going to do with this business, will that interest you? He said, okay, give me your business plan. So I went back, I prayed, and I said, Lord, 15 years ago, I was going to business school from Nigeria. I didn't have the money. But now you have established me in this business and in this industry. Could you grant me the wisdom and the favor before this man so that he will be able to support me to be able to accomplish this vision? By the time I put the business plan together, he looked at me right in the face and he said, you are the kind of a person I wouldn't mind entrusting my life work not only have you demonstrated credibility, you are helping people to start and build their own businesses. You are a man of character that I would love to support. And today, we have taken the business from just one division to having about 12 different subsidiaries. Every dime of the note that the man gave me has already been paid. To date, we are giving a portion of our profit to support many non-profit organizations. We are developing products that is impacting people. It has given me an opportunity to actually partner with the Lord in saying the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ all over the world. Bible says, call upon me. I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not yet know. And I can say without a shadow of a doubt in my mind, they are learning to hear, learning to discern and follow the guidance and the leading of the Spirit of God has been the one thing that has been the source of my confidence and whatever testimony I might have had as a Christian. Amen. Isn't that an awesome story? Semi is a present-day goose chaser. Welcome, my friends. Today is the second in the series that we just began last week called Wild Goose Chase. Rediscovering our passion for pursuing the Holy Spirit. And you and I need to recognize that it's stories like that. Shemi's story is the story of someone who is willing. Think about the circumstances he just talked about. He was the CEO of an investment bank. We didn't talk about part of his background. He got his MBA from Yale. He had worked on Wall Street. What people dream about all their lives, of arising to a position like that with perks and benefits and all sorts of influence, that God placed in his heart a passion 
that became one with him, to go out and take his gifts, talents, and abilities, and not just run his own business, but help other people start and run their own businesses. He was willing to look before other people foolish. Why would you ever leave something like that? To chase the wild goose, to find the plan and the purpose of God. And so it's stories like that. In fact, as you'll see today, the Bible character that we're going to look at, remember I told you last week, we're going to look at both present-day goose chasers and people in the past, Bible characters, who were willing to follow the Holy Spirit to where God had for them in their lives. And so Shemi's story is so much like the Bible character we're going to talk about today. But before we get there, let me ask you a question. What are you passionate about? What are you passionate about. People are passionate about about all sorts of things. People are passionate about food. They're passionate about sports. They're passionate about fashion. They're passionate about fitness. They're passionate about technology, social media. The list goes on and on and on. What are you passionate about? Because things that you're passionate about, you'll talk about, you'll dream about, you'll think about. You'll look for opportunities to engage in. But here's the principle right off the bat that I want you to understand. If you're taking notes with me, listen. All of today's message is built out of this principle, and that's this. Passion propels pursuits. Passion propels pursuits. Think about it. Isn't that true? Someone who might be passionate about food either loves to cook or loves to go out to restaurants and eat fine cuisine, okay? Someone who might be passionate about painting might take a, a, a class at night in an art school, Or they look for opportunities on the weekend to spend time painting. Someone who may be passionate about fitness will join a fitness club. Maybe they'll get involved in like competing in CrossFit or running a 5K race or riding, you know, doing a a, a bike tour or something. Because why? Passion propels pursuits. Kath and I, a few years ago, we were down in Florida. We were doing, you know, clearing out my father's condo after he had passed. And we happened to be there when the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were playing the, the, um, the uh, Green Bay Packers. And in our hotel, we didn't realize it, there was a bunch of cheeseheads. Now, for anybody who's not familiar in the sports, in it, someone who is a passionate Packers fan, they call him a cheesehead. But these people had come all the way from Wisconsin to Florida to support their team and to watch the game that day. And so at breakfast, we see all these people with their war paint on, ready to go to the game, you know, the cheesehead, the whole thing. But the next morning was hilarious because all these people who had supported their team forgot they were in Florida. And the next morning, they had sunburn stripes on their face where the war paint wasn't. It's hilarious, but what? Passion propels pursuits. The willingness to go all the way around the country following your team. Why? Because things you're passionate about, you tend to follow. You tend to pursue, right? And so today... As we look at this and kind of unfold it, we've been talking about the reality in this series, Wild Goose Chase, discovering the, the pers- per- discovering or rediscovering, pursuing the Holy Spirit as a way of life, that we were born for this. And where does the name come from, Wild Goose, a Wild Goose Chase? Because Celtic Christians had a name that they referred to the Holy Spirit as, the Ad Don Gloss, which was literally translated the Wild Goose. I think that Celtic Christians were on to something. Because your life as a Christian was never meant to be boring. It was never meant to be predictable. You see, like a wild goose, the Holy Spirit cannot be traced or tamed. There's an air of mystery and intrigue that God designed it that you and I were born to follow. And to learn the promptings and leadings of the Holy Spirit sometimes may not make any sense to us. Sometimes it may not, we may not understand all where he's leading us, but he's God and we're not. And when we learn to follow him, our faith grows because we learn to trust that even when we don't understand why God is leading us in a certain direction, we can rest assured he is at work unfolding his plan and purpose for our life in that end. But it's not something that comes automatic to us. It's not intuitive. It's something that you must learn. It's something that you must grow in. And that's why the Bible attaches spiritual maturity to our ability to learn, to understand and follow the leadings of the Holy Spirit. See, if you're living a life that's predictable and boring, you're probably not following 
the Spirit of God. But God has something for you because the dream, the life you've always dreamed of living, the dream that maybe has been in your heart and you don't even know how it would ever come to pass, Jesus promised us he would send us one who would lead us into the very facets of what God's plan is for our life. And that's what I want through this series, that you would be inspired to step out, to be courageous, to be bold enough to get beyond all of your comfort zones, to live a life that pursues God with passion, to have faith that God knows what he's doing and where he's leading you. He will lead you to a life greater than what you ever imagined. He will lead you in places that you didn't even know exist down paths that you didn't know where, were, where they were. God has something awesome for us when we learn to pursue the Holy Spirit, to follow the wild goose chase. And so listen to me. A wild goose chase is a determination to follow God-ordained passions wherever they lead. Let me say that again. A wild goose chase is a determination to follow God-ordained passions wherever they lead. See, you and I need to realize, until you find something worth giving your life for, you haven't even started living yet. In fact, think about it in this respect. What was the last week of Jesus' life called? Well, it was called the passion of the Christ because Jesus loved us so much that he was willing to do whatever it took to give his life to see all of us have the opportunity to pursue the plan and purpose that God had for his life. And you and I, when we find God-ordained passions that we're willing to give our life for, see, until you find something worth dying for, you probably have never even started living. It's that joy, it's that understanding that God has a purpose for my life. And therefore, following or pursuing God-ordained passions are integral. They're critical to a, a wild goose chase. Because why? Many of us may start out in life pursuing our passions, but unfortunately, our passions over time can get buried under a mountain of responsibilities. We have this to care for and that to do, and somehow we can allow those passions to either lie dormant or to be blunted because of all the responsibilities. But here I want to challenge you because somehow, some way, sometimes we allow responsibilities to become an excuse for not pursuing our passions. Why do I say that? Because sometimes it can be a smokescreen for fear. Sometimes, because why? Faith always requires an action. It means stepping out, trusting that what God is doing in my life, he is leading, he is directing, and it requires me to follow. It requires me even when I don't know. You see, when life is predictable, it can also be comfortable. And sometimes we can become so comfortable in the routine, so comfortable with being able to control the outcomes that we miss pursuing after what God has for us. And sometimes we can allow excuses that we call responsibilities to make us actually, listen to me, irresponsible to the purpose and plan of God for your life. And so I want to encourage us today. Why? Because sometimes pursuing God-ordained passions look irresponsible to other people because they don't know what's going on within. When you look at it, people might look at, at Shemi's story and say, how can you leave being the CEO of an investment bank with all the perks, with all the salary, with all the benefits? Why would you ever leave that to pursue something that you didn't know would ever even flourish? Why would you do that? It looks ridiculous. Sometimes making decisions to follow your divine God-ordained passions make no sense to other people around you. Think about Jesus for a moment. When Jesus was a carpenter, no problem with his family. But the day that Jesus stepped out to pursue what he had come to this earth to do, his brothers and sisters thought he was nuts. Now, if that really rocks your boat to know that Jesus had brothers and sisters, 
you need to be a Bible reader. Yes, Mary and Joseph had other kids. Sorry, that's just what the Bible says. And his family did not support it. Even his own mom had thought he had gone too far. They didn't, they didn't follow passionately after his ministry because they thought he was nuts. They thought he had gone too far. They thought he took it in a direction that they didn't understand. Therefore, they couldn't support. But you see, it's not about what other people understand. It's about what you know from within that God is telling you to do. It's following divine divine appointed passions. It's following those things. That's the heartbeat of faith. And you see, without faith, it is impossible to please God. God said, do you trust me? See, our, tr our faith grows when we learn to follow God and see that he is faithful to do all that he said he will do. Because what is the essence of faith? Believing. God is who he said he is. That he will do everything he said he would do. And God leads us from the inside out. I know when I became a follower of Christ and began to pursue what I know to understand to be the call of God on my life, my family thought I was crazy. I was in college at the time, and I started to go in a different direction. They thought I was nuts. They wanted me to talk to a psychologist. Something's gone wrong. See, my family that wanted me to get saved, when I got saved, they thought I was too saved. What's up with him? This is kooky. That's not what we had in mind. But you see, following after God may not be understandable to other people, but the question is, do you care more about what heaven thinks or what people around you think. See, I got to imagine that there's people in Shemi's life that would look at him and say, dude, I don't get it. Why would you do that? But you see, being a wild goose chaser is not about trying to explain to everybody else, but it's pursuing the plan of God. Because sometimes, again, it makes you or it causes you to make decisions that don't make sense. They don't make sense. So enter the character that we're going to talk about today. His name is, <coughs> excuse me, his name is Nehemiah. If you have a Bible this morning, I'd like you to turn to the book of Nehemiah, okay? If you're new to Bible reading, listen, just find the middle of your Bible. You'll be in the book of Psalms. Take a left, okay? You go past Psalms, you go to Psalms heading towards, you know, the Old Testament. Go with Psalms, Job, and you come to three books about a unique point in Israel's life. Esther, Nehemiah, Ezra. And you'll find Nehemiah wedged right between those two. As you're turning there, let me kind of give you a background on what's going on here. The nation of Israel, as God established them as a nation, had, a, had this nasty habit of disobeying God and doing their own thing that continued to get worse and worse. And the more God attend, attempted to help his people recognize what their purpose was, what their identity was as a nation, as followers of Jehovah, the one true and living God, that their, that their mission was to be a witness to all the earth. They had this tendency to rebel against God, to serve other nations, to serve other gods, to do their own will. And God continued to work with them. God continued to send them messengers, prophets, that would speak to them. And finally, after so many years of rebellion, so many years of not fulfilling their divine course, God said to them through the prophet Jeremiah, listen, the nation of Babylon is going to invade the, the, the nation of Israel. And you are going to be subjected to the Babylonians. And again, the Israelites rebelled. They said no. And in 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonian Empire, invaded Israel. And in his, and in his first invasion, he deported members of the, of, of the most um, wealthy and educated and talented, the, the, the greatest talent pool in Israel. He took the best of the best and took them back to Babylon. Brilliant because Babylon was a cosmopolitan city, and he, all of his conquests, he took the best and brightest and put them on his cabinet because he wanted their ideas. He wanted, to do, he wanted Babylon to be an enduring empire. And so Israel continued to rebel till it finally led it in 586 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar had it. He destroyed Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem, and the temple of Israel and deported the last of the people back to Babylon. Now to a Jew, when the temple was destroyed, that was the symbol of their faith. It was so disheartening, so discouraging, trying to make sense of it. But Jeremiah had made the promise that they would be in captivity for 70 years. And so what was amazing, within those 70 years, the Medo-Persian Empire overtook the Babylonian Empire. And the first Persian king, Cyrus, did something absolutely unheard of. Cyrus arose and spoke out and said, 
God has instructed me, the God of the Jews, the God Jehovah has told me to rebuild his temple in Jerusalem. Here was a pagan king who didn't worship the one true God. But Isaiah, long before Cyrus was even born, he discovered God knew your end from the beginning. And therefore, God through Cyrus said, rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And Jews had left Babylon and began to repilgrimage the land of Israel. But in building the temple, they were still vulnerable as a nation because there were no walls around the city. They were constantly being pillaged and taken advantage of by the nations around them. And it was disheartening to the Jews. So here comes Nehemiah. Nehemiah was born in captivity. He was actually born under Persian rule. So he had never seen Israel. He had never worshipped at a temple. He had never actually partaken of anything that the Old Testament spoken of, of sacrifices or priesthood or any of the things relevant to the Jewish faith. None of that was his history. None of that was his part. What was fascinating, though, as a Jew, he arose to a prominent position in the Babylonian, or excuse me, in the Persian court. He was on the cabinet of the king. He was the cupbearer to the king. He had a responsible position because he had the ear of the king. He had the favor of the king. It was a wealthy position. It was a position of honor. It was a position of influence. It was a position that the other Persians held in esteem. It, was a, it would be like being the chief of staff on the White House. Something that was absolutely integral to how the government functioned and worked. It was a personal and intimate union with the king. Now again, he was a Jew. So it's fascinating that he arose to that level. But listen, we come to Nehemiah and take a look at this. Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 1 says this. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Helkiah, in the month of Kisbev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa. In other words, this is where he was serving. This is in the court of the Persian king. He had an important job with a lot of perks, a lot of benefits, a lot of money he was making. He had notoriety and esteem among the people. He was serving in this capacity and something happens that changes his life forever. Look at verse two. Hananiah, one of my brothers. So one of his brothers took a trip. Look at this. One of my brothers came from Judah with some, with some other men and I questioned him about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. In other words, his brother had taken a pilgrimage and gone back to the land of Israel. He was returning from his journey, and Nehemiah simply asked a question of him, like you would ask any one of your relatives that took a trip. Maybe you had never been to Europe, but maybe one of your siblings went to Europe, and you said, hey, how was the city you did? What was the people like? What was the culture like? Where, how? He was just asking, out of interest, how was the trip? And look what happens. Verse 3. And they said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall in Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. In other words, they give Nehemiah an answer. He's just asking out of polite courtesy. He is asking out of a sense of concern. But he's not ready for the answer. Because the answer that, me, that Nehemiah gets does something that he was not prepared for. It pierces his heart and changes his life forever. Because listen, verse 4, look at what happened when he did And when I heard these words, I sat down and wept for some days. Not right away. Notice this. He was so overtaken. But what he heard that it had affected his life that for many days he mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. In other words, something that he heard absolutely struck him in his heart to such a degree he could not shake it. He prayed about it. It consumed him. And look at verse 11. Lord gives you a part of his prayer. Let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant. And to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name, give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. You see what Nehemiah became overwhelmed with 
was that the walls of Jerusalem needed to be rebuilt. But first of all, sometimes our responsibilities can give us excuses. Nehemiah could use the excuse, listen, I already got an important job. God, this isn't my responsibility. It's somebody else's job to do it. Why don't you ask my brother who went to Jerusalem to begin with? Obviously, he has more vested in this than I am. Why don't you ask him to do it? God had moved in, in Nehemiah's heart in such a way that he saw the need that there needed to be walls rebuilt in the city. And how many of us make excuses when God begins to move into our hearts? Thousand and one excuses we have. Why it's not us. Why it's somebody else. Why it's not the right time. Why it's not the right opportunity. Why right now, God, I'm not your candidate. I'm not the one. When all the time something is gripping your heart, we have a way of extinguishing things that God is sometimes putting in our hearts. But Nehemiah prayed. He wept. He allowed the situation to go. Second reality is this. Think about it. He was a cupbearer to the king. What qualifications did he have to rebuild the wall? I mean, he wasn't an architect. He wasn't a builder. He was a political man. He was in the king's service. What qualifications, naturally speaking, did he possess that gave him the, the wherewithal to be able to achieve this from God. But what I bear to tell you is this, that spiritual God-designed passions are far more important to your destiny than human qualifications. Because see, if you can do the will of God based solely on all of your qualifications, your skill sets, your abilities, then you might be tempted to take credit for what you do for God. But God says, listen, when you follow God ordained passions in your life, then the only one that's going to get credited in the end is me because you're going to discover something that you were able to do you never even dreamed was possible without my help because with God all things are possible. And here's the other part of it. All things are possible to them that believe. What are God ordained passions? Let me talk about that for a moment. What are God ordained passions? You see, think about this for a moment. What is it that makes you cry? What is it that makes you so mad that you bang your fist on the table about? What is it that makes you so excited, so happy, so full of delight that you can't stop thinking about? Because something unique happens when a human heart comes in perfect unity with the heart of God. In other words, something breaks your heart that breaks the heart of God. Something arises in you, a divine indignation that something's wrong, that you can't sit by and not do something about. Like Jesus, when he went into the temple that had become so merchandised, so overcome with sellers and buyers and all this, that the divine purpose of what God intended the temple to be, the poor and the needy and the sick and the lame could come and receive from the mercies of God, that religious merchandisers had absolutely stopped the purpose of God. Jesus couldn't step back. He was overcome with divine indignation and cleared out the temple to restore the purpose so that people once again could receive from God. What is it that makes you mad? What is it that makes you sad? What is it that makes you glad? Because in it, God can impart something to us that we conceive. Listen, if you're following with me, listen, if you're taking notes, look at, look at, look at. Passions are conceived, but what makes us sad, mad, or glad. How does God bring his will to pass in the earth? Important principle that you need to understand. How does God bring new life for us as human beings? It is when a man and a woman come together in the intimacy and union of marriage, that something can be conceived in the womb of a woman. Well, more importantly, spiritually speaking, as human beings... When our hearts are in perfect unity to the heart of God, something intimate, something personal, God can impart a passion. God can impart a vision. God can impart a word to you of a possibility of what could be and should be on the earth that all of a sudden comes alive inside of you. All of a sudden you conceive something from God of what could be in the world and whether or not you have any experience with it, whether or not you have ever even tangled with that or not, now you see something. Now something grips your heart. Now something is possible. 
you never thought possible before, because of God, all of a sudden you conceive of something. And that is how God brings his will to pass in the earth. When a human being is willing to work with God, that they receive from God something in their heart that's so personal, so intimate, that God wants to bring to pass on the earth, that they're, allow, that they're willing to allow it to grow inside of them. They're allow it to become one with them. That they believe God to bring to pass something that could never exist outside of that connection with God. A divine, God-ordained passion is born. Because, listen, you and I need to see it in this fashion. A divine, God-ordained passion is something that makes us mad, something that makes us sad, something that makes us glad. Let me give you an example. Sonia Priya, Pastor Frank's wife, she found that she loved to bake. And if you've ever had the privilege of eating something that Sonia's baked, you realize there's a gift from God in what she does. Okay? And the reality is what she started to just do with joy because it became a passion that she allowed to remain. And then all of a sudden she had this idea, well, you know what, I'm working full time, but I'm going to begin to do a part-time business on the side. I'm going to start to bake. I'm going to start to make my services available. And God began to move with that. And then all of a sudden, God moved in her and said, listen, the time has come. You need to resign your job and make this a full-time thing. You and I need to recognize. You see, Sonia was willing to chase the wild goose. It's fun and to think about the idea, but you see, faith always demands an action. And this is what you need to see. Let me help you with something for a moment. People ask the question, how do you know whether it's emotional or a spiritual reality? Well, let me answer that question for you. When it's spiritual, when God is moving in it, the more you pray about it, the more it grows. It grips your heart. Just like the gestation period of a child inside of a woman's womb, when it's fed with her coming one with that child, and it begins to grow, it begins to take shape, it begins to form, it begins to become all that God intended for it to be. And when we begin to pray about something that God is moving in our heart, our prayers don't wane, they become more intense. Our prayers don't go away. It's not something that's emotional. See, something that's emotional moves you today, tomorrow you forget about it. It's something that begins to grow inside of you. It's something that becomes alive inside of you. And here's the point. It begins to take fashion and shape that not only do you know what's wrong, but you know what to do that's right. You know how to solve a problem that you never understood before. God begins to give it life. God begins to give it shape. It begins to grow. And here's the important part about it. God-ordained passions need the opportunity to grow and to be cultivated inside. See, Nehemiah, when he first was gripped with this, he continued to pray. In other words, he didn't talk to everybody else. He kept it inside. He kept praying about it. The more he prayed about it, the more it became one with him. The more he prayed about it, the more he saw what the responsibility he had to do something about it. It laid all of his excuses aside. And now he recognized that he had this choice. Listen, Nehemiah could have been a successful failure. What do I mean by that? Well, we know this. He was successful as a cupbearer. He was successful. He had a claim of the Persians. They talked about him. He was known within Persia. But he would have only ever been known in the day in which he lived. But why are we talking about him today? Because he was willing to step out. He was willing to leave all of that aside to follow a God-ordained passion for his life. He was willing to trust God. He was willing to say, God, I am here. Whatever you want to do, let it happen in me. Because listen, if you're taking notes, listen. When passions mature into plans of action, destiny is born. When passions mature and the plans of action, you see, when it begins to form inside of you, you recognize that it's irresponsible not to follow God, that I must do something about it. Why? Because faith always demands an action. Faith without works is dead. There comes a point when you need to stop praying. There comes a point when you need to do something with what you know. There comes a point when you have to say, you know what? It's time for me to act. In other words, 
I need to fill out the application. I need to enroll in school. I need to have that talk. I need to end a relationship. I need to set up an appointment. I need to pursue something. I need to make a move. It's no longer time to talk about it. It's no longer time to just pray about it. It's time to do something about it. It's time to take action. It's time to say, God, I believe that you are in this. And therefore, it requires. And so what happened? Nehemiah, he had a plan. He saw it. He asked God for favor. And so what happened? Look at chapter 2 and verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Xerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. In other words, Nehemiah took his job so seriously. He realized, listen, my job is to stay in a position where the king is never worrying about me. I'm there to care for him. He's not there to care for me. He had such a mature understanding that he controlled his emotions, he controlled his life, so that when he went in and ministered to the king, the king had never ever seen him in a position other than joyful, other than exuberant about what he did. He didn't allow his emotions to control him. But now, because he had become one with what God placed in his heart, it had grown to the point that it controlled his very actions from without. He could not hide it from anybody else. See, he wasn't attempting to make it happen. He had become one with it. Something needed to be born because when something needs to be born, something needs to happen. It's no longer the time just to think about it. It's no longer the time just to pray about it. It's time to take action. And Nehemiah went before the king and the he went into his presence and look at verse 2. So the king asked me, why does your faith look so sad? You are not ill. This can be nothing but sadness of heart. The king was perceptive. He recognized that something was breaking Nehemiah's heart. He cared about Nehemiah. And he asked Nehemiah this. Now, notice his next response. Nehemiah said, I was very much afraid. In other words, whenever you put your faith on the line, See, people have this misunderstanding. If I have faith, I'm never going to fear. Where, I don't know where you got that from. Because natural tendencies are to fear. But you see something, faith comes from within. There's a knowing inside that you trust and believe God is totally in this. That you override your natural tendency not to act, not to do anything. See, when faith grows inside of you and requires an action of you, that you're willing to courageously follow that wherever it leads you. See, courage is not the absence of faith. It's what, or fear, excuse me. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's what you do in spite of fear. It's what you do to arise above that. And you and I need to recognize that yes, naturally speaking, we may be fearful. Naturally speaking, we may be hesitant and doubt or question. But there comes a point when you know that you know that you know something has grown inside of you. Something is real inside of you. And you know that I must act because it would be irresponsible to God. Because this is what I was born for. This is what God wants to do in my life. And I'm not in charge. I'm chasing the wild goose. That's what I was born to do. And to everybody else, it seems like a wild goose chase, but it is in truth the plan and purpose of God unfolding in my life. He said, I was very much afraid, but listen, he didn't let that stop him because look at verse 3. But I said to the king, in other words, he acted. And look what he said, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad? When the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. In other words, he was taking a risk because why would the king care about Jerusalem? And he's a thousand miles away. It's on the outskirts of his empire. Why would he care about this city? Why would he ever even want? And now Nehemiah is saying, listen, this is breaking my heart. So in other words, his job was being deterred by something that wasn't even a concern to the Persian court. So he was totally taking it all to risk. He was laying it on the line. He said, no, this is what's going on. And he put it out there. And here's why you have to allow a divine passion to grow. Because you need to be able to answer the question. See, God needs you to be ready that when he opens the door. See, pursuing a divine passion isn't you finding the lead and the Holy Spirit following you. We mix that up sometimes. We jump out prematurely. We jump out presumptuously. Oh, God, he's going to just catch me. <laughs> Unless God said jump, don't jump. 
Unless God said do it, it's just foolishness and presumption on your part. And God is not obligated to do your will. You are obligated to do his will. And there's a world of difference between it. So how do you do? You trust that God's going to open the door that no one can shut. You trust that God, that when, and here's what you have to be ready for. When God opens the door, have you allowed it to grow and to mature inside of you? You see, like a baby that's forming in his mother's womb, they have to get to the point that it can survive outside of the womb. And a divine passion that God has conceived in the heart of a human being needs to be ready to be able to stand outside of your heart. That it can stand on its own. That it's strong enough that you have the plans, the purposes. You have thought this thing through. You have an answer. You are ready to act. That when the door opens, now you must act. Now you must act. You must seize the opportunity when God opens it. And here, this was Nehemiah's opportunity. Verse 4, and the king asked me, or said to me, what is it you want? Are you kidding me? God opened up this door that no one else could have orchestrated these events to occur. But now, here it was. The king asked him, what do you want? If God were to ask you right now, what do you want? See, do you even have an answer? We have a passion, but do we have a plan? Have we prayed like it depended on God, but have we planned like it depended on us? Everything that God does is a partnership that we must take the things of God and hold them to heart, that we allow our prayer life to allow and to grow inside of us, that we have a well thought through plan that when God says the door is open, now go, that we're ready to go and achieve and do the will of God. That's why so many things of God get aborted in human hearts because we've never taken the time to pray it through. We've never taken the time to make sure that it can survive outside of our heart. We've never gone to the place of saying, God, I know this is your will. And you start to plan that God is going to move and I'm going to be ready to seize that opportunity. Faith is a partnership of working together with God. King said to me, what do you want? And then I prayed to God of heaven. See, that's the problem. We start praying when the door opens and it's too late. He already prayed. What he was asking, God, give me the courage. All that I'm about to ask, give me the ability to follow it through. He prayed to the God of heaven and he answered. See, he said, God, here it goes. I'm going all in. I'm putting entirety. I'm putting my faith on the line. I'm believing you. It's either you coming through or my last days on earth, I'll see you soon, are about before me. No, listen. And I asked the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. If you keep reading down, he also asks, listen to me, why is this so important? Well, first of all, like I said before, why would the king care about this? He could look at what Nehemiah is asking him because the king and the queen both loved him. He could look at what he's asking him as, Betrayal. He could look at that as abandonment. He could look at it going, well, if, you don't, if, if, if Persia's not good enough for you, pal, well, let me help you. We'll end, your, we'll end your employment contract right now off with his head. Could have escorted him out. His life could have been over. He was putting it all on the line. And look at what he was bold enough to ask the king. He asked the king for permission to go. He asked the king for the provision. He had the boldness and audacity to say, you know what, king? Can you pay for the event as well? And not only do I want permission, I, don't, don't, I just want permission to go and to rebuild it. I want provision and I want protection. Can you send your army and protect me? And you know the amazing thing about it? God did it all. See, when God is in it, my friends, he'll do more than ever you ever thought he would do. You see, it's like when Semi asked the man, he says, listen, I don't have the money to write you a check right now for the business. But let me tell you what my God has put in my heart to do. And he said, God, give me favor. It's just like what Nehemiah asked. He said, God, give me favor before this man. And he asked the man, Sammy asked the man, will you be the bank? He was wanting to get rid of it. He, was, he had worked his whole life for that business. He was looking to cash in. He was looking to vacation in the Bahamas or whatever he wanted to do with the money. He wasn't wanting to be the bank, but he was so moved. God moved in the situation. He said, you know what? I hear what you want to do. I want to invest in a man like you. I, you are a man of character. I see what you're doing. What did that man have to gain? He was looking for the money right there. But you see, when God is in the midst of your circumstances, when you are 
you're on a wild goose chase, God will take you places you never imagined to go, down paths you never even knew existed. God will do more than you ever thought he would do because the Christian life wasn't meant to be an adventure. It's meant to grow our faith, to trust that our Father is bigger than our circumstances, that he has our best interest at heart. And you see, the life that every one of you have dreamed of living is right before you. Can you trust in it? Nehemiah put it on the line, and the king did it. He wasn't waiting for a sign. In fact, if you're taking notes, listen, listen. Faith doesn't follow signs. Signs follow faith. See, part of the problem, we're sitting, oh, God, do something. Give me a sign. We mix up Old Testament and New Testament. We don't realize the Bible says as many as are led by the Spirit. You and I need to realize that there's a time to step out. There's a time when we go, now is the point. Now is the opportunity. I need to make a move. God is waiting on me. I'm not waiting on God. Now is the time that I must seize to do something because faith always requires an action. We make excuses. I'm waiting on this. I'm waiting on that. When God led the people of Israel into the promised land when Joshua came to the Jordan River. You see, through Moses, God split the Red Sea right in front of the people. But now God gives instruction to Joshua, and he says, Joshua, this is what I want you to do. Tell the priests and the Levites to take the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God, and tell them to go before the people and head across the Jordan River. And the Bible teaches us that what happened was this. That as they began to go into the Jordan River, when their feet got wet, that's when the river split. That's when it parted. And you and I need to realize there are times we need to get our feet wet. There are times we need to step out. There are times when we need to act on it because faith doesn't follow signs. Signs follow faith. You and I need to believe if this is what God is saying, I'm not waiting for a sign. I believe that God is going to meet me right here at this point. And just as Jesus said, and these signs will follow them that believe. I believe God God will show up and show off and be the God that always was, always is, just as ready for the challenges of today as he's been in any generation before. Why is it different? It requires something of me. And so you say, okay, well, how do I prepare for that? How do I prepare for that? You see, you got to allow God-ordained passions to grow inside of you. If you don't have one, Steve Jobs speaking to the graduates of Stanford University when he was alive. I watched his speech. He said this, it was fascinating. He said to them, find what it is in life that you love. Because to do great work, you need to love what you do. If you haven't found it, then do not settle until you find it. And what I say to you is this, what is your divine passion? Where are you today? Because critical, to being a wild goose chaser is to chase divine ordained passions. Pursue those things because what you'll find out of those things that make you mad, that make you sad, that make you glad, what you'll find, those things that give you goosebumps, you'll find the wild goose waiting to lead you to places that he has designed for you to go. You say, well, what do I do right now? I have dreams, I have desires, I have things that are in. And here's the point, if you're taking notes with me. The success of our pursuit necessitates faithfulness in our present season. What do you do right now is to remember that the chase begins at the moment that you recognize and receive that responsibility to follow the Holy Spirit. So what do I do today? Let me help you from Nehemiah's, let me take a page out of Nehemiah's book. Be the best cupbearer you can be. See, Nehemiah was successful long before he ever rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. In fact, because he was faithful, because in the present assignment that God had given him, it actually orchestrated the opportunity that God later opened up to him. You see, even though Jerusalem was a thousand miles away, his attention wasn't off on the future in what God wanted him to do. He was paying attention to the present situation that God had given him to do. Because until you're faithful with the current things that you're doing, you do not make the way to open the door to promotion to the things that God has for you to do. They're totally connected. You see, because Nehemiah was good at what he did, because he was faithful, because he gave his whole to what he was doing. He had no idea, but God actually used that to orchestrate the events of his life because if he had asked the king for permission, provision, and protection without having been faithful, he would have laughed at him. 
If his evaluation reports were mediocre at best, that this dude's got an attitude problem, then he would have never invested in him. But he was stellar at what he did. He was committed. So right now, wherever you are in life, you need to be faithful to the things you're currently doing. You need to be committed. You need to be loyal. You need to be the best at it that you can be right now. Where are you serving today? Maybe part of the problem is you're sitting waiting for the seat apart before you. God is saying, no, 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 no. You need to step out and be faithful to serve now because when you're faithful in little things, I will make you ruler over much. You're waiting for a sign. You're waiting for an opportunity for me to do something grand in your life. But the pursuit begins right now. The pursuit begins today by having a good attitude, by being loyal, by being dedicated, by being the best cupbearer you can be because it is through those events that God will orchestrate the future that you don't even know where it leads. You see, you and I have the responsibility in the present season to be committed and faithful to God. It's all a part of the pursuit that following the Holy Spirit means learning from what I'm doing today because all of it is bearing uh, an outcome of where he's leading me tomorrow. But if I ignore today, I forfeit tomorrow. You and I must see it in that regard. So listen, as we close, let me ask you. What's the wild goose chase you're on? What God-ordained passion are you pursuing? What has God placed in your heart? What things are you allowing to grow in you? What things are you praying about? And the more you pray about them, the more it brings a passion and a determination to see God do those things in your life. If you don't have one, Begin to search and to seek. Remember how you was here last week? It starts with prayer. Pray. Ask God. Be available. Expect it. Yield to it. Learn from it. Allow the Spirit of God because it's when your heart intersects with God's heart that something can be conceived in you that is your destiny, that is God's purpose and plan for your life. You see, being a wild goose chaser is pursuing God-ordained passions wherever they lead you. Because when those come to pass, they bear your destiny. God wants to do things amazing in your life. So what passion are you pursuing? Imagine with me for a moment as we close today. What might your life look like if you actually got out of your complacency, got out of your mediocrity, got out of your comfort zone and said, God, I'm going to step out. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to do something. I'm going to allow my passion to grow. I'm going to allow you to use these things in my life to see your will fulfilled for my life. God, I see it, that you want to work through my life to do something on the earth that I was born to do. And so today, just imagine with me what your life might, might look like if you began to be faithful, listen, to be responsible, to the things that God's put in your heart, the passions that he wants to conceive in you. Imagine what your life might look like. Imagine what might be talked about in heaven because of the stories that would be told of those who said, you know what, I'm not going to settle. Because too often, I tweeted this on social media this week, listen, too often people start pursuing a passion but settle for a paycheck. And they're so busy earning a living if they've never even made a life. God has something awesome for you. The life you've always dreamed of is right before you. Jesus promised you that he would send you the one to lead you to the things that he has for you. All of us have been called to chase the wild goose, to live a faith that says, God, not my will, your will be done. To live a life of saying, you know what, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to step out. I'm going to believe that you can use this vessel for your glory. And what you'll find is the faithfulness of heaven. That your Father in heaven has plans for you that are good, not evil. To give you a future and a hope. They're all tied to your willingness to pursue, to pursue your passions. To chase the wild goose. Bow your heads. Let me pray for us all today. Father in heaven, give us a heart and an understanding today to embrace the courage to step out, to allow something to grow in our heart, to allow a divine passion to be so ignited in my heart that I will not make excuses, that I'll not put it aside, but I'll allow it to grow in me. I'll allow it to become one with me, that I might pursue 
the Holy Spirit's leadings to see your destiny unfold from my life. God, today I'm tired of living in the mediocre, mundane, everyday experience of predictable Christianity. I want to follow the Holy Spirit. I want to go where he leads. I want to see the life that you have designed for me. I'm ready today. Let the courage and the boldness arise in my heart because I'm ready. I'm ready.